Okay. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to chapter 4 discussion of Through the Mists. This week we're in um, Kentucky, in New South Wales, and um, I'm really excited that we're able to have the discussion with a different group. The beauty of putting all these discussions on YouTube is that everyone gets to meet everyone else via, via the internet, and I love that. And, um, and I, I'm really glad to be able to interact with you guys face to face rather than just by email. I get a lot of emails um, of people participating in other areas um, of Australia and of the world and I really love that um, that interaction. So I try and include the comments from people overseas as well so it's a bit of a juggle sometimes so we'll see how we go. Before we start someone just asked me about the Bible and I had some emails about that as well so I thought I'd just mention um, we predominantly at home have the New World Translation because AJ used to be Jehovah's Witness and he had that's their Bible um, for no other reason than that. Um, what I like about it is that the English is very plain. Uh, it's, it's There's no ye olde language. <laughs> I don't know the technical term for that. Um, and so I find it quite easy to read. I believe also that it is they've endeavoured to directly translate from the Greek, but don't quote me on that because I could be wrong. I have also read other versions, the New International Version, which is written in very plain English now as well, and I find that very easy to refer to. So please don't feel that I have a preference for the New World Translation, it's just what I have in my hand. Um, and my suggestion is just to, online, you can, you can actually research these things and they you can read passages from each of them and just let your guides guide you to wherever it is. Um, something that Ellen was just saying before we started was that um, through the mist there's so many references to the Bible in the actual book, in the text, but it gives a lot of new meaning to um, passages from the Bible in ways that perhaps Christians commonly haven't uh, interpreted them. So I don't feel there's such an emphasis on getting the exact right Bible, but as it refers to in this chapter, it's about the spirit of the word. And um, I feel that Fred really helps us with understanding the spirit of the word. So um, no matter what you're reading, if you ask God to help you with the spirit of the word, I think it'll be more meaningful. Yeah. Okay, does anyone have any other questions before we get rolling on the chapter itself? Uh, Eloisa? I just want, have a question about the questions. Um, is it better to ask them now as we go through when they come up? Um, that's a, always a juggle. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I think from last week, or what, what I wanted to focus on a bit this week, um, one, of the main, one of the main purposes of this book club and why I sort it, set it up is because I really um, see the benefit of self-reflection in our relationship with God. Like, it's essential. If we're going to grow towards God, we're going to come to know ourselves. And to do that, we can't always rely on other people to tell us. If we're self-reflecting, then we're actively engaged in, in that process with God um, if we decide to involve him. So something I wanted to emphasise today was just how much self-reflection I go through when I read a chapter. Um, so I thought what I would start with today is um, the, I think the second question I have listed is what are God's truths outlined in the chapter? And I thought we could go through the chapter in that way, looking at the truths, because this chapter, um, I think I listed 21 or 22 truths within the chapter. It's a big chapter in terms of truth. Um, and so perhaps, Eloisa, in answer to your question, as we go through the chapter, if there's questions pertaining to that section we're in, if we ask them then, I think they'll come up anyway as we explore the truths. So does everyone understand what I mean by that? Let's just go for the truths and um, let's have a drink of water. Any other questions before we get going, Dave? I don't know if mic, so... Mm -mm. <coughs> Just a <laughs> it's a cosy group this week, I love it. We're actually, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but we're, but we're actually beside a fireplace. Because uh, it's pretty cold here in Kentucky, and it's lovely to be so cosy. No Just microphone. Two questions from this chapter, maybe they've been covered and I haven't heard it yet. Sure. Um, but first of all, Fred talks about his 
his lack of enthusiasm on earth, but yet he's full of enthusiasm in the spirit world. Has there been a change in him? No, and we talked we talked directly about that last week. Right. So that gotcha. recording, there was just a little technical hitch and that recording isn't on YouTube yet, but there is a sound file. Right. And we speak directly about that for about five or 10 minutes okay. in, in the last discussion. Yeah. So, in short, no, it's just that the conditions around him have changed. And so that allows part of his personality to to come out. And also, Fred, as we get to know him, is quite a modest character. <laughs> so he's always kind of uh, um, dryly almost putting himself down and, and, and reflecting how the world viewed him, not necessarily the truth about him. Yeah. So, um, but we talk about that in more length in the last discussion. Yeah. Has everyone, is everyone up to date with reading? Have you all read chapters one to four? Mm -hmm. And how are you finding it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Emotional. Yeah. Emotional. Hard, hard yeah. going, actually. Was, uh, yeah. It is a bit hard going sometimes. Isn't it? A lot of it I just couldn't comprehend. Is that because of the, the why is that, Ken? Uh, the words were big and yeah. I couldn't understand. Yeah. And, and I'd miss missed the interpretation when I read the dictionary, right. going back and reading, so I couldn't connect to the to the passages and the, to the meaning. The meaning. So hopefully, hopefully today, if you um, keep in mind those questions and those things you didn't understand, mm. let's talk about them mm. as a group. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was I'd really. Love that. I found that was really good in the opening. And you said, um, did the chapter. Um, about the questions, did what did it bring up? Like, and that was what, one of was the most yeah. for you, yeah. And yeah. it was like very yeah. heavy. Yeah, yeah and, as, and as I was saying before the group, Ken, if you can let yourself connect with some of that grief, I think that'll help you a lot with opening up mm. to, the, to the spirit of the word. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Teresa? Um, I, I've heard this before, and yeah. um, I really love the visual stuff. Yeah. Um, but this is. This, I was finding today it's really a um, different experience for me actually studying it because yeah. I, I do a lot of reading but I've never actually done a study of a book. Yeah. So it's really taken... Um, I mean, I, I can get things quite quickly so I don't I skim over a lot. Yeah. And so actually having to slow down and understand everything, all the poetry and stuff has been quite enlightening in some way. It shows me how I'm not... Stopping and smelling the roses. Yes. And not life, yeah. Thing. Yeah. And the and the the, t the prose is written in such a way, isn't it, that every sentence is almost a metaphor, and there's so much meaning. And mm -hmm. honestly, I could spend three weeks on a single chapter because there's just so much. Like I said, the 22 that I wrote down, and I know there's ones, what I deemed smaller ones, like yep, there's you know, colours that denote your condition. Like, that wasn't even a big truth for me in this chapter. There was just, there's just so much there. And it's so powerful if we open our heart to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave? With regard to talk of God, like, it's, it's all through here. Yeah. But in other aspects, you know, I've come across, when I've spoken with spirits, when AJ's spoken with spirits, God doesn't rate a mention. Yeah. Is, and, um, in when you say God doesn't write a mention, Dave, what do you mean? Sorry, um, God doesn't get spoken. <laughs> Certainly writes a mention with yeah. AJ. <laughs> yeah. God doesn't get spoken. By the spirits themselves, you mean? Yeah, um, by the... Um, it, it, for, for, for Fred, a lot of his discussion with his helpers revolve around God and God's gifts and God's grace, all those sort of things. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering, is that because he has a desire for God? And it's easy for others to mention that. Whereas well, he's asking, isn't he? He wants, he wants to. Um, this is something. Um, as he reflected a little bit in the first chapter, yeah. he he couldn't resolve this issue on earth. Or he did resolve it to some degree, and by saying he lived in a society that was very Christian, and he was raised by his father was a religious man, and he he tried very much to fit into that society, but he felt there was a lot of hypocrisy, and you see that in chapters one and two. But he kind of, that was his inquisitiveness actually coming out, him trying to resolve that while he was on earth. And what he came to believe was that 
God was a God of love. He, he understood that truth mm. um, and he let that guide his life, this idea of service to other people. So he entered the spirit world desirous to fully understand what does it all mean. Um, yeah. Because so, that was in regards to like, <clears throat> like Angelo's story where nobody mentioned God until he progressed a certain amount of the spirit world. Yeah. <laughs> and if you think about it, about it in the text, we're shown that everything is based on desire, isn't it? So he entered and he had a big desire and so everyone went, okay, let's help this guy who wants to know things. Whereas other people enter and they, they, don't, they don't have the desire, they're still in fear. Or, or, um, and that's something that's we're shown again and again through the chapters that the way we are now, it doesn't change when we get there. So, um, you know, we have the possibility to deal with our fear now and become more inquisitive in this like we can become like Fred right now here on earth and develop that relationship with God and actually receive the truths of the universe or we can live in fear and that condition won't change once we hit the spirit world we're still going to have to deal with that fear so as, as you're aware the law of desire operates upon you know everything so if we desire it we, we receive it yeah okay Susan so Mary um, I've just found reading this this is the second time I've read the book and yeah. I've just found this time it seems to have moved from my head to my heart and I'm just sort of so emotional on every page almost yeah. um, and it's like I'm feeling my way through the book rather than reading the book I don't yeah. quite yeah kind that's of quite fantastic as... yeah um, that's been my experience too I first read through the mist yeah. about two or three years ago <laughs> and it was very I I was struggling, I was thinking, oh, oh, that bit's nice, but oh, what does that mean? And, and I blamed the language, oh, it's all about this language, and it's all, oh, I just, because oh, I'm an avid reader, or I used to be, and I, I went, no, I can't, can't do this. Now picking it up again a little while ago, and now rereading, um, it's so emotional for me, everything. And, and I, I want to pick up, if I don't understand a word, I just want to find it in the dictionary, and then I get it, and then I get it even more. Um, so... It just seems to be layers and layers of emotion there for me, yeah. and it just goes deeper each time I read the sentence, almost. It's, yeah. it's quite an extraordinary experience I'm having. Yeah, that's lovely. And as I prepare for each week, I read this the chapter two, three, four times, and I have that experience as well where I think, wow, there's more there, there's more there, there's more there. Um, so I feel it's such an amazing gift that Fred's given us well, in thank his you desire. Gift too, because yes. in you go, this weather's is just wonderful. Yeah, so thank thanks, you. Very much. I'm enjoying it. I really, it's, it's a lot about my own journey as well, in, in just um, deepening my relationship with God, but also beginning to act in my passion um, yeah. and take some risks in that way. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I did want to mention um, about because I have received some emails from people saying, "Look, I'm struggling. I can't. I can't get this. This book is hard." And or especially in some chapters, some people go, "I'm great with this book, but this chapter is really heavy." And so I just wanted to mention, what do you what do you think affects? We've mentioned it depends on how open we are in our heart, doesn't it? But what are some of the other things that might impact on how readily we can read or receive the messages? Alexis? Um, for me, and this ties into a bit of, about how I'm triggered, is is um, he's very grateful by nature, yeah. and, and he spends a lot of energy on that. Yeah. And the sad truth is I'm seldom that grateful at yeah. all, like not even close. Yeah. Um, intellectually, I could be thankful mm -hmm. to people, but I'm not... Often I'm not terribly moved by, you know, like, I mean, even just say like what you and AJ have brought in my life is wonderful, yeah. but I'm like not moved in that, you know, really passionate way. So I think the first time I read it, it was just like this feeling like, oh man, this guy's wasting so much time on this, well, you know, on this, on this what I call blah, 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 blah. <laughs> But the reality is, um, I'm just kind of like coming into touch with that, like, why am I not grateful? Yeah. yeah. What's, what's going on here? And that's probably what I wanted to talk about, is yeah. that um, I feel the reason that you don't feel grateful is there's so much sadness in you yeah. about being taken from in your life. Yeah. And so it's hard to feel. But on top of that sadness, there's some fear of that sadness. And on top of that fear, there's some anger about it. Right. And, yeah. and that makes us sort of less 
able to receive or have gratitude for what we receive and less likely to give. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the truth, the sad truth um, sometimes. No, and I feel like I'm like, you know, there's a certain point that's become so pessimistic yeah. about all the crap I've received in life and all this, like, even as he's receiving all this, what I feel is like good, pure information. I'm just like going, I've just been shoveled bullshit yeah. so much of my life. And so there's this jaded quality in me, you know, yeah. it's like... And the weariness that, that we often feel covers yeah. a lot of grief. It's similar to depression, you know, it's yeah, this, yeah. this feeling like, oh, underneath that is all the anger that we yeah. have, you know. So um, I would encourage people if they're feeling that as they're reading the book, to just let yourself connect to those feelings, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. It's, yeah, it's giving me a lot of rage. Yeah. yeah. Jodie, did you want to share anything about how... Because I know it's brought up some things for you as well. Did... Um, I'm finding it really hard to read. Mm -hmm. um, not just each chapter, but the whole book. Um, and each chapter just brings up more and more anger for me. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm just struggling with that, I think, at the moment. <laughs> Do you know why it might like what the anger is about? Um, different things. I think anger around not wanting to feel the amount of grief that is within me. Yeah. And my resistance still if I don't want to go there. Yeah. Um, but like for this chapter, for instance, I read it three, four times, and all I could, all I can feel in the chapter is the woman's pain. That's the only thing I got out of the chapter. Yeah. You know, I could see all the beautiful stuff around, and I could see all of God's beauty and the love, and but I just, I just get angry about it. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm struggling to release that anger, I suppose. Yeah. So. But you're closer to the you're closer to the block, you know. Yeah. So this is what the reading gifts us. We yeah. go, whoa! I can't even connect to that because I and there's my emotion, you yeah. know. So that's that's the way you can use the reading. Other people um, have written to me and said, oh, just in this one part, I just had to read it, had to reread it, had to read it, had to reread it. There's nothing happening, and often it's spirits that are hooking into. Either there's some resonance there between the two of you around denied sadness or denied fear or denied anger, which they're hooking into, and often it's because they haven't had this beautiful experience when they entered the spirit world, and they're like, that's not what it is for me, you know, and they want to tell you, <laughs> you know, about that. So if that was me, I'd take the opportunity to let them tell me what their experience was and invite them to learn a different way, but also discover what it is inside of you that is causing that attraction and, um, you know, causing you to step out of the reading. Mary, yeah. I had a very similar experience like that. I started reading one page and then before I knew it, I just skipped that whole page. I'm down the bottom wanting to get off that page completely. Yeah. It's like there's something weird going on. And I identified the exact part. And what, did, what was the part? So it's, for the purpose of our view, we were standing upon the slope of some majestic mountain chain. Yeah. And, and then what I was just, oh, I've got a the printed printer, copy. Yeah. It's <laughs> page 39 of, of the printed printer. copy. Okay. Um, and so I just got this massive head press on my mm -hmm. head. And it was like all this anger and rage about, like, this is just wrong, wrong, yeah. can't be that way. Yeah. I said, guys, you're up there, I'm down here. Why don't you go and find <laughs> out and check this out and see if, see what's out there? Yeah. And it just went instantly as yeah. soon as I did that. Yeah. But it was like, wow, how often do we just skip over a whole page even? Because yeah. we just don't want to feel that. Exactly. You know, feel yeah. that. Laura? Um, the first time I read it a year and a half ago, um, I... I'd already kind of said a prayer before I began the book that I was just going to feel the book and not get too literal about it or else it would put me off and I'd never read it. Um, and so I was feeling my way through the book and then all of a sudden when it got into like a quarter of the way, my head, um, exactly like my head would really, really start to hurt. 
um, and I was like going, no, I'm not going to stop this. I'm going to stay with it. But I didn't realize how much of a fight I was. It was like, no, you're not going to stop me. But still engaging in this, like, you hit my arm, I'll hit you. No, I'm not going to stop. No, I'm not going to stop. Yeah. But um, now when I read it the, it, the clarity and the calmness and there's just no spirit attack, it's like my openness now to receive truth is coming more so I don't have it literally my head was literally in pain and squeezing and it wasn't until AJ said to me that they're really unloving spirits that don't want you to read this material because they don't want you to know the truth and uh, a year and a half later it's a completely different experience and it's almost like I know that if I read it again in another year or something it would go into a deeper level of emotion definitely so uh, definitely love, love to keep reading on an annual yeah yeah we can do an annual it's probably going to take a year yeah. to get through the book but <laughs> then we'll just start again yeah. <laughs> um yeah and the other thing is when we like in this chapter it talks a lot about the fact that there is a consequence for our sin and a lot of us personally not let alone the spirits around us find that quite challenging so that can interrupt with ha- the ease with which we receive the chapter yeah yeah i think i can support that through the spirit attack i had that i yeah. shared with you um yes it was about the feeling that it wasn't at all the way it was portrayed in the book but there was this huge realization about the um the errors they had within themselves and we ended up having a channeling as you know to, yeah. to help some of these spirits that were just attacking and yeah. so angry about us reading how beautiful it all was yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and that so go ahead. Um, i had a um big down this morning reading one just one little bit and i was reading I couldn't, I was getting quite annoyed with the flowery language when he was describing the beauty Mm -hmm. um, of, you know, all the wonderful um, beauty and everything. And I thought, why am I being annoyed by this flowery language? Because, you know, I write flowery language. And um, I realised, and then I just had this sort of meltdown, and I realised that it was, um, I was so... um, in grief, I had I was getting angry because I had so much grief that that I've seemed to have felt since I was a child that that's he, he was talking about um, how all there's all different nationalities and how every person has is able to enhance everybody else's happiness mm. and bring more love to uh, everyone and to the to the world. And since I was a child, I felt that's how this earth is supposed to be. Yeah. And I had so much grief, and I realised that I've been very, very angry with everybody for a long time for not feeling love, the love that I know you can feel. Yeah. And yeah. Um, can you grief s- about that. Yeah. yeah. And can you see that's a bit of a theme, like what this feeling of disillusionment about like Alexis's sentiments and your own is this feeling that there's nothing good here this is all very nice but this I can't believe in this because I'm so disillusioned with what's what's around me and um, that's really what you're expressing this this I'm resistive to the beauty that is existing here because I feel so sad about the fact that it's what's existing in the spirit world because I feel so sad that it's not there around me yeah and and what um the deeper meaning to that is that we actually prevent it happening around us because we we're anger. holding on to that anger yeah I realized stopped it myself because of the anger and I and I went and it went even deeper and I realized that I I was feeling responsible for like we're all responsible for making you guys come back, have to come back to help us here because like I felt it was it yeah. was just like the consequences of my error were could be extrapolated as being really ex- extreme. Yeah. And be careful there though, there though that spirits don't jump on you to make you feel like you're responsible for all of the darkness in the world. Um, I, I have felt that before but I thought it was a big release of grief yeah. and I also realized, felt that I was angry with my mum because she never felt my father's love for her mm-hmm. or what I felt was love from yeah. him and that extravagant as well. Yeah. Yeah.
it was, it was amazing. It's good, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of power, power in um, staying present while we're reading it because there is so much yeah. truth there. Yeah, that was just two cents. Yeah. yeah. I want to realise actually the fact that I love this book and I have my love of analysing literature. Like, yeah. But the lack of emotional connection. So I don't find it hard to read. I love the imagery and stuff, but I was like, wow, it's still very intellectual, mm -hmm. not heartfelt. Yeah. 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 I I got a little I love I'm exactly like that. When I first read it, I I just couldn't get enough of it. This is great, this is great. And it um uh but now I'm reading it now and I'm starting to and this is an allegory. I think this book is such an analogy to um to to how we cope with life and how we because I just gloss over things and you know want to know what to know and then um, but and and I feel that um, uh, this whole book going into the spirit world is an analogy is what happened to us now whether you, you're, you and Jesus have come back to show us exactly what he's been revealed to what's possible what's yeah. possible and where you know where people say so we don't have to go to the spirit world to sort of have this experience where we're having no, that. and that's what I um, yeah. const constantly um, try to bring into these discussions is how and this is what I really want to focus on today is how is everything that is dis demonstrated in this chapter relevant to my life right now because every single part of it is um, it's very easy to think this is a story about the spirit world but in fact all of the truths are God's truths and are relevant for our life right now and also having the knowledge of what happens after we pass um, and that, for example, we remain the same except that we lose our physical body. How does that impact on the way I live my life now? And so there's there's a lot there's a lot there. Yeah. So uh, Vanessa, I want to get started, but yeah. oh no, just further to that, I was feeling into um, when he said punishment is endured in the natural consequences. I was just reflecting on responsibility yeah. and um, what a privileged position where everyone in this room is in and it was sort of expressed in some of the other book um, book groups that we have such a huge responsibility not not but to ourselves and to God because we have this gift and um, yet I'm still living in a very unloving manner and um, that's actually causing more of a consequence on my soul now because with because gifts there comes um, responsibility yeah. and that was a, a big part in the chapter for me yeah. that when he was saying, oh, well, if people genuinely don't know, they're not going to reap that consequence. So. Yeah, and we should talk about that in, in, in depth, what that really means, because I think that's a really interesting part of the chapter. But it does reference the parable of the talents. Did anyone look up the talent? No, the I didn't the talents? Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's just briefly talk about that before we talk about the rest of the chapter. Eloisa, do you want to tell us what the... Should I just summarise? Yeah. There's three, there's a man with three servants and he gives one, I'll tell you exactly how many. I think it varies between the books. He, okay, so he gives um, one servant more, like each one gives less, um, and the first servant he gives quite a lot, the second uh, middle amount, and the last one he just gives one. Talent. And a talent is money. Yeah. Or, or a bar wealth, of uh, or gold or silver or something. Some, yeah. And so he goes away and um, comes um, and he just says, um, you know, can do with this sort of, they're in care of it. And then he goes away for a while. He comes back and he asks each servant what they did with it. And the first servant says, like, Master, I, um, I, I basically invested it and I made twice as much or, or heaps more for you. I can't remember, was it yeah. twice as much? Or more, pretty bit. I think right, that the things is yeah. getting the facts wrong. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> make the story. Yeah. I said, you're wonderful, fantastic, you know, great. And then he um, talked to the second one who had not done as much, but he had done something with it and made more for his master as well. Um, and hit the master congratulated him, said, you're great, fantastic. And the last one said, oh, I dug a hole and buried it because I knew that you were, um, oh, it was quite exactly. rude to him actually. Yes. 
yeah, he was like, um, I knew you were a hard man harvesting where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. And he gave, gave it back. And the servant basically just said, you evil man, get out of my life. I don't want anything to do with you. Um, with the parable kind of being that, um, that, that if you're willing to serve and make even more for someone, um, like that's sort of a loving act, I took it as. Um, yeah, what does, so does everyone understand the story, what happened in the story? Actually, what happened was the, the master went away and he gave the talents to each of the servants in different amounts. And the first one who had quite a lot of talents invested them and got double the, double the return. And he gave that to the master. And the master said, okay, now I'm putting you in, in the second book. So this, this um, parable is told in Matthew uh, 25, verses 14 to 30. And in Luke 19, verses 12 to 28. So it's told twice in the Bible. Um, Teresa? Where was this reference? Because I, I totally missed it. Oh, okay, sorry. It's quite near the end of the chapter. And it relates to what Vanessa was saying, <coughs> which is why I bring it up. It's on page, page 47 of the book. I'm not sure what it is in the printout. 43. But it, 43 in the printout. Oh, thank you. And um, so Yusmos is talking to Fred about the fact that Fred's shocked. There's rulers in other spheres. Like, I thought God was the only authority. And um, Yusmos references the, the parable of the talents. Because in the, the full story of the parable is that the master comes back and the ones that have uh, made good on their investment, if you like, he puts in charge of different cities or different... Um, that's in Luke, I think, that's related. Um, so that's why Yusmos references it. He says... Why are you shocked? Even in the Bible it says, Jesus told you that the people who um, did things with their talents were given rewards in terms of rulership, um, but that the governing force is always love, God, and God's power is ultimate in the spirit world. So that's how it fits into this chapter. But um, what is the full meaning of this parable, do you think? Because it, when I live in fear, I think, well, no, aren't I doing the right thing? Just saving that talent for the master. I'm not risking anything for him. And when he comes back, I can give him back what he, what he gave. Mm -hmm. So that's my fear-based position. Mm -hmm. So why were the ones who invested and gained more rewarded, Matthew? I guess it's like kind of the, that willingness and acting on that willingness to risk it all for love. Yeah. Okay. So that, that God gives us gifts and if we're willing to use them to take the risk, there will be gifts given back to us. Yeah. And this, I feel, it relates to what Vanessa is saying about, you know, I have this gift. What will I do with this gift now? Will I live in fear and just guard it for myself and try and, you know, figure it out? Or do I want to share this gift that I've been given? And... And the truth is when we live in fear with any of our talents, be they monetarily or literal talents or gifts we have from God, um, because they've all been placed in us by God, these parts of our personality and things that we can offer to others. When we live in fear and try to guard them for ourselves, we're actually being very selfish. Can you see how selfish yeah. fear becomes when we live in our fear? Um, and so the, the last slave who just hid his talent was in a state of fear and he didn't wish to um, take a risk or do something more with what he'd been, the gift he'd been given. Mm. So I feel um, Yusmos is in, in the chapter just demonstrating that there is possibilities for leadership and rulership for people who understand God's mercy and God's love. But there's more in that parable that I felt was really beautiful to talk about. Dave? I didn't didn't quite understand the, the parable from, and I've heard it many times over the years about how um, how the last servant makes a comment about, um, God, yeah, I heard that you reaped where you did not sow and whatnot, and so mm -hmm. I was fearful, like making him out to be a hard man. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what we do with God a lot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he also, um, from memory, uh, the the master also replies, "So you heard these things, and yet you still did not." And I forget the rest of it. So I still. So what I feel about that, that is that um, he didn't trust in the goodness of his master. His goodness, the, his master gave him a gift, 
and yet he still listened in his fear. He's, he's an example of someone who lives very strongly in fear. In his fear, he listened to the doubts and the, all the things that other people said about his master, not recognizing this man just gave me a gift. Perhaps, you know, I could trust the gift. And can you see how this relates to our relationship with God? Um, we, can, we can live in fear of this, oh, you know, okay, God's given me this, this mind, this heart that wants to love and explore things, but maybe I should just play it safe, you know, because maybe he won't be that kind to me if I mess up. Um, whereas we can, we can take the, the um, example of the other two servants who went, wow, this is fantastic. I'm going to go out into the world and do what I can with these gifts. And then there are rewards that come. Because the sad truth is there are punishments or penalties that come when we live in fear. Mm. And you will feel them in your day-to-day -day life, but you'll also feel them after you pass, you know. Every time we've decided to, if Michael's given me a gift and I've gone, thanks, Michael, I'll guard that for myself forever and ever. Um, that's a very, because maybe I'll never get something again. And, uh, you know, that's a very um, selfish and often fear-based way that I live. He gives me a gift and I go, hey, Laura, check out this gift. Do you want to share some? Um, be that a gift of love, a gift of friendship, a gift of something physical, whatever it is. Then there's rewards right here and now, but there's also rewards after we pass. Is, is it also how love multiplies? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It can't multiply unless we're willing to. Unless when you're buried. To, yeah. And the truth is, um, one of the recurring themes that we see all through this book is that I, I think I talked in the first, very first book group about the fact that love, when it really exists in our heart, will lead us to service. It just will. If we, if we truly love, then we're willing to take a risk. And in the second or third chapter, we talked about the fact that faith without deeds is dead. Uh, which is also referenced in the Bible, but that's the same thing. When I truly have faith in my heart, I will act in that faith because I have it in my heart. When I don't, then then I'll you know try and hide it, and nothing can multiply in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what wasn't that? Sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to. Uh, wasn't that gift to the third one also taken away mm -hmm. and given to someone else? Mm -hmm. So that. Yes. yes, so that's, in a way, if you think about it, that's the penalty. Yes. It's like if I give you um, if I give you a violin and you can play very well and then you hide it in your back room forever and never play even for yourself or somebody else, why would I keep giving you, I'd say, oh, well, I'll give the violin to someone who wants yes. it, who's going to take joy in it. Yes. Yeah, and, yes, and appreciate it. That very interesting yeah. that you it's yes it's taken away and and therefore you've got less mm. yeah so if we if we um if we don't um really receive what we have mm. and be willing to take risks and and explore what we have then it actually it becomes a negative thing in our life we actually lose mm. so all the while we're trying to hold on to something we end up losing yeah yeah. That also explains, there is, and I can't remember where it is, a verse in the Bible that says the more that God gives, uh, the more the person has, the more God gives, and those that don't have very little, it takes away. It was always a, a really hard verse to sort of understand. I um, I read until, it in this and this, 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 this really explains it. It's, yeah. uh, he means he, those who use it, more will be given. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ellen, do you know where that is in the Bible? I, I know it's there, but yeah. to me, I remember like from, from more of my Bible days that yeah. this would totally put the fear in me. Yeah. And because of your, you know, like I guess your concept of God already, you apply to it. So yeah. to me, it was almost like God is cruel. You know, yeah. it, was, it was not making me, <laughs> you know, drawn to God. And probably deep down, I knew that, you know, I probably had talents or something, but I had no idea what they were. And I'm probably going to have to do something with it. And <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> pressured and wasn't a loving kind of revelation for you. <laughs> but even even rulers, like I think it's it's not really our concept of heaven that that there are still kind of hierarchy or kind of order, and that there are actually people taking care of areas or. 
Like that's totally, you know, but it makes so much more sense than just, you know, everybody just there kind of doing nothing. Exactly, know? I love what he says yeah. in there, you know, this harps and well, clowns like, thing. And, yeah. and I think, yeah, who wants to go to heaven? I'm holding no, on to no, life. No, like, no, like no, it's just going to be sexless, you know, kind of just sing, I'll be singing out of tune on, and we need a Roko to teach me how to play the harp. You know? and, uh, I've, I've heard AJ discuss with Christians before that a lot of their, their fear of death actually is because they feel yeah. like heaven is just <laughs> not going to be, it's going to be pretty bland and we all have to be kind yeah. of pristine and uh, yeah. yeah, so it feels a lot more loving. A lot of people use that as a justification for unloving behaviour, like I'm going to hell anyway, I'm going to enjoy my life and yeah. we very much have that in our society today. Yeah, we do, it's true, mm. rebellion. The rebellion is a huge emotion amongst our generations that are currently on the earth, I feel. Yeah. All right, well, let's get down to the chapter proper. Can somebody just give me a quick summary of what happened in this chapter? Yep. <laughs> um, he he go um use must takes him to um or shows him different things mm -hmm. and at the beginning he goes um to a place where there's a whole congregation of people um and a lot's happening and he learns a number of lessons there um he's seen people meet isn't he yes yeah, yeah i'm just trying to yeah, yeah he no, sees lots of people meet and he actually sees like law god's laws in action yes. in that meeting as a teaching tool i yep. take it as yeah um and then they go through sort of more and he sees and realises like, um, does Yusmas take him to another sphere or just the higher, yeah. the one what Yusmas, sphere it is? Um, lends him energy, energy so that he can it's kind power. of go to a higher sphere and see and so, what's actually yeah. there in this higher sphere. So I'm not sure exactly what sphere he goes to. It's yeah. certainly not a, like a high, high sphere. It's yeah. maybe the second or third sphere. But he gets to see how people are living in that sphere, doesn't he? And yeah. This idea that there's no competition for joy. Everyone's in joy and everyone can add joy to the other. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. And then he has to, he wants to rest so he can reflect on everything he's learned. Yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. So who saw some truths? Let's start at the beginning of the chapter. And I'll show you how I um, approach this in my book. So as I'm reading, I make two columns, the truth and its relevance to my life. What, what I found is that, uh, sorry about those things, and maybe we'll just start this as an exercise, but uh, what I found is that people emailing me their responses, I'd get two or three kind of truths and then a couple of sentences about the relevance to, to their life. For me, I have, I think, about six pages written <laughs> of mm -hmm. reflections of, wow, this is a big truth. What, how am I acting on this in my life? What does this mean? Have I really felt about God's truth in this way before? So um, I thought it, it might be fun just to, to approach a chapter this way this week. Mm -hmm. So what's the first truth? That you see in the chapter. No gate, no barriers. No. Yeah. There's no barrier. There's no barrier. Yeah. So there's no, no angel with swords or <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and in the last chapter we learnt there's no judgment hall, there's no you know, we don't have to it, there's no barrier, it's a free, yeah. Okay. Alright, let's keep going. What else? He says, doesn't he say, oh, this is in page 31 on the, in the um, book, um, he said, here I am, I've learned all of this, but I'm still the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. So we're learning again, nothing changes. I just, my, I lost my body and I'm learning some more, but I'm still this same person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we retain our personality. What else? Um, and we had left time as well as death behind. Mm. Yeah, and time is a little um, irrelevant for him. What a 
what about the one about the single, every single incident was a self-contained oh, heaven? Yeah. So everything was just perfect in its in its own mm. instance. So this is not necessarily um, one of God's truths, but this is him displaying his, like, joy at what's happening. Yeah. Isn't yeah. the truth that every single moment is... Well, it's not a truth because it's not true for everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's true for Fred as he's going through this experience, but is it true for us right now? Is every moment a self-contained heaven at this yeah, moment? Yeah, no. 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 It's a possibility. It's God's a possibility. truth is that it's possible, yeah. but it's a possibility. Uh, you create your own hell. Oh, yeah, Matthew, if we go Matthew. Um, yeah, that the working of God's laws or the machinations of them are more readily apparent in the spirit world. Okay. Well, yeah. I guess they, they're apparent here, but you know, if you have eyes to see them, I guess they're feeling them. But, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's something that I reflected on a lot in this chapter. There's a lot of written about God's mercy is everywhere in his works. God, the, the machinations of what he's created are there in front of me. And I'm asking myself, wow, am I seeing that? Because that's true here as well. It is. Yeah. So how am I opening my eyes to that? Yeah. Uh, um, but I find that here um, we are allowed to deny those things and actually defer the pain. You know, whereas that lady was writhing in pain. And I, that doesn't happen at this place here no. as much where people could actually sleep quite comfortably for years. Yes. Even though their souls are in pain. That is so, the truth. Yeah. So how is this relevant to my life right now? What does that make you think about in your life right now? I'm avoiding. Yeah, what am I avoiding right now? Mm. Because it's it's not going to be gone from me. Laura? Um, that This whole week has really been about that particular one truth. Mm. And um, I was imagining going into the spirit world, even though I could have used the analogy of right now, but it just felt like I was in the book and I was just like, when I get there, who would I see there? Like if we all just went there, who would I see now where if I was completely exposed, would there be any shame with anyone? Yeah. And um, there were four people that I identified with, you know, like keeping a secret or not talking about my sexual abuse with the perpetrator and, you know, big, big things in my life. And um, I either rang them or wrote them an email and confronted it. Awesome. And I explained to them about um, the soul and the spirit world. So I, 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 I said it in truth. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing afterwards the response I got because it just felt like this, um, like truth is like white king for the soul. Like it was just, I felt so pure within myself and I was more in my desire and more in my passions. And, and I started doing things like running and playing the guitar with this really childlike joy, like bubbling that, I can now go into the spirit world and look everyone in the eye and know that there is nothing now. Like, I feel pure and clean. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's my desire as well. Like, I read this and I go, okay, how how is this relevant to my life right now? And what action can I take? Which is the fourth or fifth question that I ask all of you. What action did I take in response to these truths, in faith of these truths? So, yeah. yeah. And you feel the benefit right now. when I was writing the email, I was like, definitely my body because I'm calm but I'm writing about stuff that I'm going to get so attacked for and um and one can't yes one was full attack back and one was like I understand that I would love to have the experience of having a clean soul and that was an affair that happened in the family and and with the sexual stuff it was I'm so sorry that I did that to me and there was this forgiveness and so everything but it was like it wasn't that there's no way that I was even thinking about how it was going to unfold it was like this is just the truth write this email in love and then whatever comes is going to be coming and and that's when we begin to harness the power of truth when we just honor truth yeah. nothing else when we don't try to control the the variables or the outcome or have an investment if we just honor truth we begin to see its power in our life. Definitely. Because I normally perceive the attack shaking in my boots as I'm riding it, my stomach goes really tight, tense, but I was really, it's really calm and I felt really um, supported when it was happening. I just love, mm -hmm. yeah. Matt, Matt? Um, 
There's one part uh, about the uh, Yusuf Moss is talking about the ladder she's gone down the pipe. Yeah, so let's not skip to there. Oh, sure, no. Let's, there's still more, still more truth on page 32. It's possible to meet with those we knew on earth after we passed. <laughs> He's observing that happening. Separation at death is only temporary if we if we desire it, we can meet people again. So what does that, so in my relevance column, now I'm writing, how does this impact on my life now? How am I living in harmony with this truth right now? Or how am I living in disharmony with it? Just with our children, all the fear they have that they're going to be hurt, all that something's going to go wrong with them, it's, it's really not God's truth. It's really about me being concerned with the consequences of, of them departing. Yeah. And that there is no depart, departure. So my investment in having them, having them in my life yeah. is often yeah. more at play. If we love, we do care about how our, our, the welfare of our children, but it's not with that same fear-based, death is the, old, is the worst thing that can happen. Yeah. It's more about their, the love that they receive and their spiritual welfare. Yeah. And my identity um, as a mother, to make myself feel worthwhile in life, to justify my existence. Yes. And yeah. 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 Teresa? Um, it strikes me about um, if, if you get a if you can think that you're not going to meet these guys as people again, then you can just pretend it never happened. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's lots in it, isn't there? This this idea that separation through death is the worst thing that can happen, uh, but also the fact that I'd like to stay separated from you forever and ever. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can skip over in that. Absolutely. Okay, so now let's get on to talking about the woman. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this because the, the pens are a little um, faint. Can you even see that at the back? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so let's keep going a bit. So, uh, Matt, what were you going to say about the woman who... Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a little bit further when Mr Moss was referring to her. Yeah. Um, just that... Uh, um, that uh, um, he says of her own free will and deliberate act she fitted herself uh, on earth to take a certain place in this life and she cannot assume any other without enduring the pain that would naturally ensue and so for me what it meant for me is like I can work through it like she could potentially go to those places if she was willing to feel that pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. In order to be the condition that would allow. And so it was like, oh, so, you know, when I go to the hells now, I'm, I'm doing it like I can change if I have the desire and it can be as fast as, or as slow as I want it as to I be. As I want it to be. So this is a, be this is a beautiful truth that Fred's helping us know, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yes, there will be um, things that are weighing upon our soul and we will have to, you know, um, pay the penalty if you like but it's completely up to me there's that beautiful line where it it's says the only obstacle in the way of us lies within herself, yeah. within herself. Yeah. and that's the truth for all of us so that that is at the same it can be a heavy truth or it can be a very in, empowering and inspiring truth yeah so let's talk about what happens with the woman though she, we see her she's coming towards the towards her two children isn't it and she's full of terror She's full of terror and she doesn't want to face them. And because she doesn't want to face them, she has, she has to almost. She's drawn to them. And what do we see? What does the daughter do? She shows her love. Yes, yeah, shows her love. She braces her and, and loves her. Yeah. And she's like freaked out by that and walks away. And then I love the jewel of forgiveness goes and sits on yes. her. Yes. And for her, I suppose, at some point to recognise it. Um, and it won't go until she's forgiven. Until she's, yeah. until she's re ready, ready to, to receive the forgiveness. And Catherine? I also thought the um, that, that little bit there was that it will help her in working her salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. so what do we learn here? We learn about repentance, forgiveness. This is now I'm summarising what's in my book because it's a bit too hard. And we learn about penalty, if you like. So how is this relevant to our lives? <laughs> um, the, well, the, all of that. But the forgiveness particularly for me, um, I was just like, wow, one, to get an image of literally what it looks like to forgive. Um, and it brought up a lot of things of like, um, oh, well, pain for me, um, as how much I don't want to forgive, how much I want to blame, how much I want someone else to repent before I'm willing to forgive, yeah. um, how much, like, yeah, I just want to dwell in my pain, really, um, yeah. and stay in the fear rather than allowing it. And it's been said, like, do I want to wait 5,000 years for that? Well, yeah. maybe not. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that's because my choice. Because if we contrast the condition of the girl with her mother, yeah. she's in a far more loving condition. She's, she's worked through enough to be able to forgive. Yeah. And in doing that, not only is she free, but she's able to give this amazing gift. This, that forgiveness is a real substance that we give to somebody else that can actually assist them massively. And she's free here, like the contrast between her and her mother. Yeah. That was amazing for me, yeah. due to living in fear most of my time. Yeah. So yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, that, that really, really um, touched me because it showed me, uh, well, I, it's maybe a little tiny bit after, but the whole section showed me God's mercy and how He's created places where people will be comfortable according to their condition. Yeah. They're not like tortured if they're in a bad yeah. soul condition, yeah. made to go in a place of yeah. great light and love, which would be torture for them. Yeah. yeah. So that's skipping, skipping ahead. Yeah. So if we just stay on repentance, forgiveness, and the penalty, yeah. how's it relevant to our lives? Yep. Oh, it was, I don't know if this is relevant actually, but it's on forgiveness. So I was just wondering if the daughter had forgiven the mother, yeah. would that have been another penalty or a hindrance on the mother or I mean I know no, it would be, no, no. no. so um, as it says throughout the chapter what's what's the penalty on the mother is the actions the sin they stated as the sin that she has kept within her and acted upon in her life yeah. and that's affected her her daughter yeah. now her daughter has had to work through all of that and reach a place where she's able to forgive yeah. that doesn't alter what the mother has to work through yeah. because the daughter had to do that through her own will yeah. Yeah. but the gift of love of forgiveness from the daughter will at one time teach the mother so much about what love really is yeah. and and offer her almost inspiration and incentive to move yeah. but it does not lessen her yeah. her will always be with her that yes is. yeah so what that makes me think about is how often have i given the gift of forgiveness mm -hmm. and when i truly forgive that is a real tangible gift i give to the soul of another person mm -hmm. uh, that is incredibly powerful even powerful enough to assist them and inspire them out of the hells mm -hmm. the other thing i think about is we see her coming towards her children on the path and she's terrified, isn't she? She's terrified to face the people she's harmed. Yeah. So I ask myself, am I still terrified to face the people I've harmed? Because if I am, this story tells me I keep myself consigned to a hellish condition, don't I? Mm. Yeah. Which is very powerful if you think about it. Yeah. Mm. Susan? Um, I have a lot of tears in this section. Yeah. And I'm still struggling, I think, with the lessons of love or the aspects of that lesson of love because um, particularly when it got to the point where it, it was said um, it would be a mockery to give her any advice or any word of consolation yeah. and I just sort of realised this emotion and, and injury I have around wanting to rescue everybody yeah. and yeah. realising... Which Fred was feeling as well. Well, wasn't he? Yeah. He's like, oh, can we, quick, can we help and her? And realising yeah. that it's actually an unloving act or a loving act and I'm still, I still struggle with it. There's, just, there's so much emotion in myself yeah. about that. Well, let's talk about when it would, would be, um, when would it be loving to offer something to her? Perhaps once she's recognised it and she's going to feel remorse about um, she her asked. actions, would that be? 
Yeah, it's actually when she asks, which is actually when she's more willing to face. Mm -hmm. So both answers are correct, really. Everything is based on desire in the spirit world. That's why Fred has this, this amazing journey, because he wants it, you know? Yeah. And, um, and he's so inquisitive that it just comes to him. Before he even, like he's talking about, he's there on the hill and he's watching other people meet their family members. He hasn't even thought of that yet, because his desire is to understand everything. Yeah. And, and so that will come to him later, as he desires it more. So when this woman is still in a state of, I don't want to face this, it, it's, a, it's a waste. As Yusma says, this is a waste to talk to her because she's not actually going to receive it. It's sort of goes through from the book to the mediumship because I was thinking, well, the angry spirits that perhaps come to us through mediumship are actually asking for help. We're not sort of saying, we're not offering the... The consolation and and the advice until yeah. they actually come to us. So, and if you think about the sort of consolation between those two, definitely there there is always a, if if a spirit doesn't want to know the truth, they just won't stay and listen. Yeah, mm -hmm. and but if you think about it in our mediumship, we never offer them consolation as such. We never say, yeah. oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you'll be right. It's you're not that bad. Yeah. No, we say lovingly. Actually, this is happening because there are things inside of you. So I just sort of recognised how, in my natural love days, how much of that I used to do. You know, it's like, oh, this will be all right, and, and this protective sort yes. of mechanism that was actually very unloving. I was sort of seeing that in myself. Yeah, it's one of the great injuries on the planet, isn't it, that that actually is love, to help people yeah. avoid their pain. Yeah. When, when we see that in the spirit world where everything is governed by love, yeah. that is never the case. Mm. And I just find it really easy to go back to that still. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So there's a fear there that causes you to want to go back to that space. Can yeah, you that, I, that they won't feel I'm being loving. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because yeah. that's the common uh, viewpoint yeah. on the planet. And now everyone's going to say, oh, that Susan, she's not very kind. And because we haven't resolved that within ourselves or because yeah. we're just afraid of the attack of other people, that can make us bend, if you like, or, yeah. or not want to actually receive that truth in our heart because the fear is still greater. So I just yeah. see how often in that space of, rather than yeah, yeah. being truthful and loving, really. Sure. Sure. Vanessa? Oh, I've just realised maybe, maybe I'm go going from a different point to truth, but just in the order of the chapter, yeah. um, probably one of the things that affected me most was... Um, Fred's humility and the fact that he said, I was so happy in the contemplation of the bliss of others. I had no idea that I was singular in my condition. I just went, oh my God, like that would not be me. I would be going, oh, look at all these happy people. And I have projected that, particularly with the soulmates and all that kind of thing. Well, it's all right for you guys. You've got each other. And um, just my level of self-absorption yeah. compared to someone like Fred, I just... Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty blew me beautiful away character, hey? Yeah. Really? Joy also wrote something about that. She said, Fred was so happy contemplating the bliss of others. And she said, others' bliss makes me feel less than, missing out, inadequate. Yeah. And I'm not loving. Yeah. Much yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So... Um, this is just blowing away the power of, because when I do read this, the prayer is that this is a, a, a gift for my own progression and awareness, but I actually saw that whole thing as a woman was was jealous of another woman who was in love with her soulmate, and I, I had to look through it going, Mum, daughter, son, like <laughs> what? I just... And it made me reflect so much on, um, and, and particularly it was coming up with with females of are we really genuinely happy when we see another sister that's either progressing or in love or happy and um and my experience of other females has been no which makes me reflect on where am i doing that as a law of attraction of if a female really has something extraordinary happen to them what part of myself goes oh i wish i had that yeah. or self-absorbs and brings it back to my lack before the love of their happiness. Yeah. So that really opened up a whole doorway of competition and competitiveness with females awesome. particularly. Yeah. So it tied into it that. Ties in. And yeah. so why is it that Fred can Fred is not like this? Why is he like this? Who can tell me? 
I don't know, I went into a bit of psychology too because remember he didn't have a mother and it was a bit about this thing about the mother, uh, how quite often mothers project onto their child, you must love me and we're taught that we must uh, have love, we must, so it's sort of, he didn't have the mother injury. Um, no, I don't think that's it <laughs> Because we see he's seeing so many things. So he's seeing, as he says in the chapter, Everyone, everyone's meeting their family members and I didn't even think of myself. That's because he didn't have a mother and he, he said before he no, got used no, to not no, having a mother. No, no, no. <laughs> it's another quality that Fred has. Um, uh, we'll go to Matt. <laughs> He's, he reminded me quite a lot of Jesus really. Um, massive desire for truth. And also that he uses his reason a lot of the time. And I felt He does, but there's another reason why he can just be happy for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Karina. Uh, he's truly compassionate in his heart. Yes. Yeah. Why? How did he get to be compassionate, Mary? Because he lived a life of service, so he had, he had his own practice all the way. And how did he? How did he live a life of service? What was the quality inside of him that made him be able to genuinely serve with all of his heart? Mm -hmm. And Louisa? He loved others. How come? Well, we're all sitting here going, "Yeah, I'm not like that. I'm not like that." What? Why is Why is Fred different? What does he do, Alexis? He could feel the pain of others and the joys too. And how could he feel the pain of others? He was humble. Uh, he, just was, yes. uh, he, he was humble, which means? He felt his own pain. He felt his own pain. Yes, he own pain. He, in his life on earth, he felt his own pain. And that liberated him to have compassion for the pain in others, mm -hmm. but also to appreciate the joy of others. Because he wasn't so, and many of us skip over, we don't understand this. Mm. We don't understand that actually if I feel my own pain, I'll actually feel more joy for my brothers and sisters yeah. when they have joy. Mm. It's our avoidance and our resistance to our pain which makes us snarly. <laughs> you know, I don't want to feel, <laughs> that's my uh, abbreviation for it, but you know, I don't want to feel how much it hurts that my sister is, in your example, Laura, you know, like my sister's doing really well because I, it's not that I feel it, it's that I don't want to feel it. I don't want to grieve it. Yeah. And so then I want to pull her down or ignore it or I, I don't feel happy for her. When I see it and I grieve it for myself, then I differentiate her joy from, from me and I go, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes, Ellen? I just have a question like, regarding Fred and you said because he, he felt all that, but like, I don't see any indication of him processing in the... In the chapter? Is in the chapter, no. We just assume? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think as the story progresses, you know, this is three books, we, and he also touches on it in the first couple of chapters. Yeah. He lived a life where he didn't get approval from society. He was very much living on the fringes, doing his own thing. And he was very sad. He let himself feel sad yeah. about it. Yeah. He, he did process his, yeah. his feelings, yeah. I felt yeah. that too. Uh, Laura? There could also be an element of um, what you were sharing earlier on is um, he probably took himself on the fringes of society because he could feel that the love that he knew existed wasn't existing. So when he actually saw it and recognised that it was real, it was almost like just the joy that it's not an, uh, it's not an illusion, that the joy that it, uh, God's universe literally is loving. Well, he like, had placed faith in yeah. God's universe being loving. So he had two things. He was humble to his own pain, but also he placed a lot, he decided within himself through his own journey in his life on earth to trust and have faith that God is the God of love. Mm. So that also freed him up a lot in the way that he viewed the pain and suffering of other yeah. people. He didn't get angry at God. Someone else wrote to me, um, I think it was Lorleen, and said, you know, how she read after reading the chapter how wrong I feel about blaming God for my circumstances when I see everything that he's doing there you know I'm blaming God for this but God's actually got all these loving things to help draw me back to love yeah yeah also he ends up basically having no expectations personally mm. for himself that's yeah. right because he's been willing to grieve yeah. and because he did he didn't have a mother and he wasn't close with his father and we talked about this a bit last week in the group uh, 
he, he actually spent time on his own. He decided what he felt for himself. He yeah. grieved mm-hmm. for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I was saying to the group last week, very often when we're really caught up in the family dynamic and in addictions with other people, we don't actually create a lot of space for ourselves to feel mm-hmm. ourselves because we're always trying to avoid it mm-hmm. through these addictive relationships. Have that experience. So he was very alone and it's his very young childhood. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he had a he lot was of alone. For most of his life on earth, yeah. Yeah. Just sorry to add to that point where I was saying before, and I recognise it's actually my demand for constant attention and approval that is creating this self absorption. And um, I I don't know how I got there, but I've I've touched on a very small amount of grief that I've actually never loved anyone my whole life. Like, I've, I've missed out on that joy of giving, so I was grieving for myself yet again, like more self absorption, but that joy that there must be in actually giving from love I yeah. just haven't ever allowed myself to do that to so feel that that yeah the the beauty is the more that you grieve the more you will naturally do that yeah to do it. yeah 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 okay uh dave we should move the on the very to first page <coughs> he actually says uh for my so received from nor extended to any member of the household any sympathy Mm. So he's basically alone inside his own family. Yeah. His brother, his yeah, sister, he was. his father. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's, okay. Let's keep going with our truths. What the next truth I have is on page thirty-five of the book. And Eusmos is describing what happens for people who go to the hells, to the hellish conditions. And he says, to Fred. This is pretty powerful. Um, it's about what creates our hell, or what happens. Terror, Terror makes it. hell. Terror makes it hell. <laughs> so, can you can you see why that is practically the case for this woman? Because, yeah, so, Eloisa? No, you can't. So terrified of facing up to what she's done, this gives every, she, 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 she doesn't want to face her children, and then she descends to a place, and because she's living in this terror, she's terrified that everyone else around her is going to torment her with what she's done. Mm-hmm. And as Yusmos says, people are waiting patiently to help her, mm-hmm. but because she's embroiled in this terror. So how, what does this make you in life? I just felt that it's no different in my life than it would be in the spirit world because that is when I'm in, I sometimes have times when I'm not in that state but a lot of the time I live in that space and I avoid everybody, I isolate, I, not necessarily from what I've done for others because often my repentance is lacking um, but more of what's going to happen to me yeah. um, and so it's, yeah, I just was like, wow, this is what I'm living now. So, so in, in when we when we live in terror, we kind of render ourselves powerless to to the forces of love, to anything, yeah. don't we? Let me ask, and I was like, wow, like if I didn't live in this space, what would I do? And who would I be? And how would I interact with the people who I'm afraid of? You know, and that was kind of like, okay. <laughs> yep. I'm not sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, I said, um, our terror of being punished rather than a desire to repent makes a hell. Mm. We fear others and in fact through that we give them power to torment us. Mm. So the reflection Mm. in my own life is if I repent and I feel, I know this truth through some lived experience recently, if I repent people have no power to torment me. You know, how can they talk and say, yes, I did that thing wrong? <laughs> yes, I'm deeply sorry about that. Yes, you know. Whereas if I'm trying to avoid it all the time, people can shame me with it. Mm-hmm. People can scare me with me. People can punish me with it. People can do all kinds of things mm-hmm. to control me or control my life. life. Whereas when I open up, face my fear and repent, I become so much more empowered in my own life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we actually create the detail our own hell as well. Yeah. Totally. Design it and everything. Yeah. Every well, aspect of just it. Just as, as as we progress in the spheres, our condition in love creates. Well, it's always our condition in love that creates our yes. surroundings. Mm-hmm. So, be it in the hells or in the higher spheres. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah.
Um, I had that lived experience. It was it's just amazing how it's just that the chapters, like everything in like Laura through Law of Attraction with what you're reading, it lets me really feel the book experientially. But um, on Saturday night, when I sang karaoke in front of everyone, I was in terror and flew out of my body and I didn't check in and get back into my body. So it left me open to so much attack to which I was literally engaging in my passions and desires, but shaking in the core of everything that was coming. And it was almost like I, my whole hell was being created until I got into the car and then just went, God, did I do anything wrong? I was singing and dancing and having fun with my friends, with my soul, I'm like, no. And all of a sudden, as soon as I checked in, came back, all the attack just completely just went away. Mm -hmm. But because I was out of my body, it was it was hell. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, it, like, there are actually things that we have done wrong that we do need to face. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> actually facing them like in your example you hadn't done anything wrong but for many people like this woman she is very afraid to face what she has done mm. and because of that she feels like that's the worst possible thing she can do face this thing she's done wrong she's terrified of it and yet in facing it she opens herself to all of this assistance and guidance she opens herself to the feeling of forgiveness from her daughter you know it doesn't make it go away what she's done but she is suddenly the people around her have less power over her to keep holding her in a dark place. Yeah. Okay. Next truth, on the same page. What happens when she tries to go down the paths that don't match the colour of her robe? So a wayside truth is that the colour of our robe is, you know, indic indicative of our condition and the paths we follow also indicative of our condition. Susan? Um, well, there, it was quite obvious that she was in terrible pain and I think that that flows on to the fact that when we're denying our own emotions we go through a lot of pain like yeah. we, we we get into the pain and it just seems to sit there or we, we sit in our pain rather than feeling the causal of what it's really about yeah. 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 and we or we can sit in our fear yeah. and there's almost like a connection between that and our, and our addictions, I feel, sometimes. It almost becomes addictive, that pain or that fear. Which Ooh, that's where, where we create addiction, when we yeah. avoid those things, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So there's sort of connection. And for her, that she was just feeling so much pain when she wasn't um, yes. in the path what, that was for that me, was, that was uh, her, condition. her soul condition. condition. Yeah. And what, what did you think about the fact that when she faced her children, and her daughter was so loving towards her and gave her the gift of forgiveness. Did anyone else see that there was an opportunity there for her? Yes. Yeah. So, so God gave her an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. She could have immediately just connected yeah. to what she felt yeah. and her, her colour would change. Yeah. So there was that opportunity, but she didn't take it. So she tried to go down these other paths yeah. and, and it, because of the love, it triggered her pain. Yeah. And so, as somebody else mentioned earlier, God in his mercy is, is creating somewhere for us that it's not, you know, that matches our condition where, our, you know, where we're able to live comfortably until we're ready to face that condition. But also what it made me feel about is the fact that, and it's something very real for me, that in the presence of love, my pain is triggered mm -hmm. and I have the opportunity like, to receive the love and allow the pain. So um, many of us get very, we, we block love because the actual, we block the love that does exist around us because when we receive it, it triggers the grief. Mm. And so then we keep ourselves small and hiding in these kind of hellish kind of places in our life. Mm -hmm. Teresa? Um, I see it as the parallel of the bit of more truth. It's sort of like when someone gives us a truth and we feel uncomfortable with it. It's sort of like, I, I was sort of envision, envisioning it as, as a bombardment of love and truth and it's just like too, too much and I just can't cope with it. So she goes somewhere where it's a bit more comfortable. Exactly. Yeah. But can you see inherent in that, in that, in that it's too much is, is the decision that I don't, I don't, I don't want to feel. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, so I said, in the presence of love, our pains and our injuries are triggered. Unless we're willing to feel this pain, we'll be forced away from love. That's actually a, a physical law of the universe and as demonstrated in the spirit world. And so if I repent, this is how it's relevant to my life, if I can repent, I can receive more love. While I resist pain, my heart stays closed to receiving love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mary, I just thought the interaction between Fred and Umar is so beautiful in this. Like, because he's got this opening, discovering, and inquisitive mind, like, there's this, this really beautiful sentence where he says, I see again that you're unable to reconcile the woman's presence here with the simple law of love governing this life. And he's like, Yeah, look, this just confuses me. And then he goes into actually what, what yeah. it's all about. And it's like, just by having this. It's like, if we're open to it, then we actually can learn by being in that open space. Absolutely. Fred's not caught up in the facade of, oh, yeah, no, no, I get it. He's like, please help me understand. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like, why is this going on? What's this process? Yeah. So it's just this really beautiful interaction between the yeah. two of them in yeah. that whole dialogue with I, the woman. Yeah, and many times in the text um, with Yusmos, there's this real, there's a beautiful thing in the last chapter where he embraces him with such a, you know, a brotherly love that he mm. can't, we can't pretend we're strangers anymore, you know? <laughs> There's just so much love coming from him, yeah. Yeah. Alexis? Um, this woman coming to that space, um, was that kind of like an anomaly situation? As in, like, would most people just go directly to the state they're in? And that she only had been brought up to the space because of the interaction with the children? Uh, my understanding, I think, Alexis, is that it, they're seeing a vision of people entering the spirit life and they all along the paths. Ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, the way I feel about it is that it's not exactly the same for everyone. Yeah. But certainly, as I just said, God always wants to give us opportunities. Like if you think about it, how many times in a day are we given an opportunity to mm -hmm. receive truth or yeah. grow our soul? And so I feel like this thing happened with her children because God wanted to give her mm -hmm. the opportunity to face it. So. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there, we will be afforded opportunities as we enter the spirit world to deal with things on many occasions. When we say, no, this is not my desire, then we go to the place where it matches that desire. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rose? Um, well, I've certainly been offered the opportunity to um, just be with what you're saying um, this last week. Um, and when you say about the terror of makes a hell, I've finally gotten to see how my shield that I've lived out from of being so fucking angry and the harm I've done on others. Because I haven't wanted to feel my own helplessness. And I, and I know I have a lot to be with, to feel, and to and be in repentance about that, but this chapter just was such a gift. That's good, hey? It's always a perfect time, hey? Another, another opportunity. Yeah. Um, we go to Dave. The, the coming together, like, it actually says in there that, she, that this woman struggled and tried to get away from, from the two. And to me, uh, I don't exactly know how, but it was like God's law of attraction. You know, here's an opportunity, here's an opportunity, here's an opportunity. Yeah. And even with the daughter coming up and, and giving her love, here's another opportunity. Yeah. But yet, even still, she says no, but there's still more opportunities when she finally gets down to... Mm -hmm. That's right, and Yusmos says those beautiful words, doesn't he, about the fact that... Um, now I'm going to find it. Um, about someone being in a highest or, or is that the, the Lord is good unto all and his tender mercies are all over his works yeah and Yusmos actually talks in here about the fact that you know so much effort will be given to her to help her come to see these things yeah. um, there'll be someone in a little bit better state than her that oh, won't go down her, yeah. and um, the fact that in time, the very fact of her daughter's forgiveness and everything that happened will be, it says something about her teachers adding layer upon layer. Mm. Um, that's very beautiful. Let me just take a moment. Actually, so, the reason why she did come up onto that 
plan is that later on she knows there is a possibility of a better, brighter. Definitely. Memory. I think it says that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that reminds me of the spirits too. that we see. They don't even, that we hear about mediumship. They don't even seem to know or have they forgotten that there is a... Well, many of them haven't entered into the spirit world. They've never oh, left I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah. Um, okay. um, so you, yeah, they haven't been through this process of the allocation of their soul, the location that their soul oh, would draw yeah. them to. Yeah. Attraction, that's what you mean, isn't it? Yeah. 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 They've okay. never gone to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And do you remember in the earlier chapters, um, it was possibly just the third chapter, where um, Helen says to Fred, we need to keep moving because there's an attraction back to your body. Mm -hmm. um, so many people never even reach the place where we're seeing these things happen mm -hmm. yeah. because they, they already it's too much for them and they want to go back. Or some of them never even cross the mist because they want to stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just would really like to find this part yeah, of the text you've got to take. I think I found one. Yeah. It's just after uh, the only obstacle in the way of her, her happiness lies within herself. When she's able to recognise this, it will become a powerful incentive to improve her condition. It will teach her that punishment has been to purify and not vindictively inflicted. It will be a text upon which her teachers will build a hundred arguments until she learns that even in her dark condition, she has not been forsaken, but though she knew it not, the hand of God was guiding her. That is, that, that is exactly, yeah, yeah, it's very beautiful. What page was that on the printout date? It um, started on the bottom of page 35 of the printing, mm -hmm. and the top of page 36. <coughs> All right. I'm going to sit down and keep going, but I just wanted to make the point that so far we're like three, three pages into the chapter, <laughs> and I already have... Um, seven or eight truths and I have like a paragraph written in terms of its relevance to my life on, on each truth uh, looking at it from all these different ways that we're talking about so I don't think we need the board longer but um, let's keep going with the truths okay so it's very beautiful what we're seeing demonstrated isn't it that um, there's so much love for this lady, even in her denial, that someday soon or later, it's up to her, there's going to be so much that's going to be revealed to her just in these small loving interactions that she's had. Okay, the next truth I have, does anyone have any more questions up to now? No? The next truth I have is on page 37 of the book. Yeah, sure, Matt. Um, to do, as far as I can understand it, to do with um, the, the pain that uh, is transferred through to our children, we actually bear the burden of that. Yeah, that's on page 39. Yeah, that's oh, sorry, I've just got a different copy. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it's a bit tricky with the different types versus the... Actually, it's, it's, I, I think it's the, same, if it's the same thing Matthew's referring to. It's another couple of paragraphs after that one I just read. That one you just read, yeah. No, so I'm still back on page 37 of the book where um, he says, The word of God is spirit as well as truth mm -hmm. and must ever be interpreted by the spirit, mm -hmm. not the letter, that being merely the form in which the spirit finds expression. As the mortal body is but the organ of expression for the soul. Mm -hmm. The fire of the spirit is love. Therefore, to say that God is a consuming fire is but another way of declaring that God is love. Mm -hmm. So there's a few Bible references in there um, just prior to that, which talk about God baptising people with fire and things. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested, the references in the Bible are in Luke 3.16, Luke 12.49, and Hebrews 12, 29, that's what he's referring to. But let's talk about this truth of the, the word of God is spirit as well as truth. How, what do you think about this? Where do you reflect on this, Susan? Well, like it gets back to what I was saying earlier. It's like feeling God rather than intellectualizing God. Yes, yeah. And it's like the spirit of God is within our emotion and our feeling rather than in our head or in our yeah, well, when we understand a truth, it's from our heart, not our yeah, head, definitely. Yeah. And when we rely on the head, it's very easy, and this is something I've been talking to the group in Queensland about, it's very easy to just apply a few terms like, yeah, divine love, law of attraction, um, causal emotion to our life, 
and not actually change the way that we live, yeah. not actually change what is inside of our hearts and our real relationship with God. So I, when I was um, reading that, I was thinking, do I remember the spirit of love is vital to understanding and living truth? It is the spirit of love that he's talking about. And um, I cannot know truth truly unless I understand it in the spirit and context of love because everything that God has designed is loving. Mm. So if I forget about love, if I have a belief, if I'm faithless, um, and there's, I'm not sure if it's in this text, but it's something that I was reading during the week. Romans 14, there's a, a part that says, everything that is not out of faith is sin. Mm. And I, that is such a truth, isn't it? Because when I don't have faith in a loving God, <coughs> I'm living in fear, I'm living in, um, like, I want justice and retribution and all of these things and immediately I'm in sin. When I live in faith of a loving God, I'm I'm living in this trusting way that if I honor truth, if I, you know, if I'm honest, if I'm humble, things are going to work out fine and I'm going to receive love. But when I don't have that faith, then immediately I'm in sin. Mm. Not because someone's judging me to be in sin, just because that's the natural state of being that changes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I also said many people take the words of divine truth and apply them, which is meaningless unless they live in their hearts with a desire to love. So that's another um, big desire that I have with this group is to really look at the words, look at the words that we talk about so often and go, what does that mean in my life? Like, how, how am I changing my life, acting in faith? Like you said, Laura, about, okay, right, that's the truth. How am I going to act? To, to live in that truth and the rewards were immediate for, just for your own soul yeah. Yeah. and also for me I've been listening to, um, to people speak but really feeling them more and even though the words um, seem um, you know eloquent and nice and, or even loving um, it's not what I'm feeling and to really trust that my feelings more so than the words that are coming words, out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We kind of live in a world that's very based on words, isn't it? Yeah. You take it, um, the the law is in words, and it's it's all about yeah, literal, mm -hmm. and and that's a point that he's making also about the Bible in in this text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can have words which mean something. The same words can mean something completely different depending on the spirit that they're spoken from mm. or the place they're Well, yeah, spoken. and he's talking about how in the, I think this is where he's talking about in the Bible where um, because there's just an emphasis on the words written rather than understanding that every word must be teaching me something about love, then the meaning is lost. Mm -hmm. So it, we must ground everything in love in order to understand the universe and God. And that's something that we talked about again last week in the group. Uh, about if I understand love first, I have this amazing logic with which to understand everything else around me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ellen? I think sometimes we have a uh, tendency to want to make rules even with love. Yes. Like instead of the, just the spirit of love and it becomes rules and we want definitions. If you love, you'll do this, this, this. But even though we follow all those rules, it's not love anymore. Because we lost the spirit. Yeah. yeah. If we kept so, the spirit, we wouldn't need. The we would always act in love. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm learning, and I think in in the Bible even it says somewhere that against love there is no law. Yeah. So it's almost like you, if you if you act in love from your heart, then it's always going to be good. You yes. know, for, for yeah. everybody. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Beautiful. And very often I I have people ask the question. So what would I do then if this mm. happened and that happened? And and I often say, we well, want a rule. There's no rule because there's going to be different emotions and things happening. Like, is it loving to hug a child when they fall over? Is it loving to give somebody money when they're broke? Well, it totally depends on all the spirit in the situation, and and love would dictate that you that you honour love and not addiction. So there's no rule. You have to feel it, and and that's beautiful if you think about it. God doesn't want us to be these dependent little beings um, reliant on rule books. God wants us to fully understand love in our soul. And that's the way he's designed the universe, so that we will come to fully understand it. It's like, um, and I know there's many references in the Bible, and AJ talks about it a lot, like if I, have the, if I look at another man 
and I don't act on it, but if I sexually project or that's a, you know, that's a crude analogy, it can work for many other analogies. If I project rage at someone, that is, that is in my soul, uh, you know, if, if I can use the rule, I'll never yell at someone, I'll never break the marriage vow, I'll never do, but if those things are within me as desires and feelings, unfelt grief and fear and rage, then, then I haven't got love yet. And God's going to show me that. And if you think about that, how loving is that? God's making us liberated because once we fully understand love, we can do anything. If we're bound to a rule book, it feels constricting, doesn't it? That's why lots of people have issues with all the authority references in here. What, there's rulers? No, they, that couldn't be God. That couldn't be loving. And that's because we, the authority that's been used over us, the rule books that have been used over us, haven't been in the, in the spirit of love. And so that's why we fear them. Mm. Yeah. So, just if we go to Rita. Yeah, um, because it said rules, and there is another thing. Can I read that passage of, of that idiot? Or how, how far uh, are we skipping ahead a bit? Or? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm on page 36. So it's that mind, body, or unbalanced mind is the result of yeah. sin. So, so we're, we're not there ahead. yet. We're okay. not there yet. Thank you. Yeah, we're nearly there. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's get there. <laughs> okay. All right, what, what's the next truth that someone saw in the text? So we're just talking about the Spirit of God. Yeah, was one before that um, I felt of free will um, yeah. when she's running, and it says um, our own free will and deliberate act, she um, put herself on earth to take a certain place in this life, and she cannot, even if she would, assume any other without enduring the pain which would naturally ensue. Yeah. So this is all about the consequences for our actions, isn't it? It's yeah. showing that when we use our will out of harmony with love, there's going to be a penalty. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that cannot be a penalty. Then. Yeah, that's okay, though. Yeah. But as I said, there's so much in there, and I haven't yeah. written it all. I felt that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's so much, Dave. Just a, a line or two after where we were, mm -hmm. um, he says, now love in its debased form becomes passion. Like in the way um, yourself and AJ teach passion, is there a difference here? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what I, I think. Like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to me, it's it's like uh, uh, he's saying that love, passion without love, without some sort of guiding force of love. Yeah, he's talking about lust with lust without love, mm. basically. Yeah, yeah. and and up, up in Queensland, we've talked a little bit about um, the way that language is used in in this in this book. Um, it's used in a way to help people from a different time who are used to the Bible to understand the messages. So this idea of punishment, um, which is used a lot, I don't believe there's punishment in the way that we understand it now. Mm. There's no uh, retribution, you know, it's all about correction. But they use the word punishment because punishment's used in the Bible, you know, and it, it's just a way of helping people understand the, the messages in there. Yeah. Alexis? Um, actually, that one line that I felt was like an error because you're basically relating love in some degraded form. And to me, love is, a mutual, is an exclusive pure emotion it's not like there's not a degraded form of love no that's right so he's he's but he's just making the point yeah. the way and earlier on you know in previous chapters he's talked about love drawing the spirit of the person back to their body and we talked about the fact that that's not love actually right. that's addiction but it's the way that love you know yeah, he's helping fred from the place that he's yeah, at at that time I to be a point of mention just because i found that there's been in in our world there's these things like oh that's tough love you yeah. know there's all these modifications on um love that are just promote a lot of error certainly yeah. i agree yeah yeah um i was an, oh, sort of to do with that thing but i felt um another truth was um Oh, that God doesn't ever judge us and allows us to do anything that we want, basically, because of the laws set that is made. Um, that a beautiful analogy of being a piece of um, chaff, and then finally you yeah. uh, you get to the wheat, yeah. and you're basically moulded or I don't know um, cleaned beautifully <laughs> until yeah. you're prepared to love. Yeah. Um, so anything you do 
they just kind of made me go, wow, even though I may choose really unloving things, I'm not terribly bad. I'm just choosing them because of something inside of me. And I'm creating chaff that I'm yeah, going yeah. to have to burn off. It's yeah. going to be burnt off me. Yeah. But underneath it all, there's kernels of wheat. Yeah. And I found that kind of exciting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's, that's the idea. Um, that was my next truth that I had actually. Yeah, that all, all conditions in the spirit world are corrective, not punishing, and the fire only burns off the chaff. So it doesn't affect this beautiful part of us. Mm. It's also on the other side of the um, either children or others engaging in that behaviour and we say, that's really unloving, or why don't you stop that, or why don't you go to AA, or why don't you try, you know, nick it to whatever it is, but just being loving and just knowing that that's where they're at because of something inside them and like we don't want to feel our own grief of seeing someone being unloving to themselves so we try to control that instead yeah. of feeling our own pain and allowing someone the free will even if they want to degrade themselves. Yeah. Mm. But, but it's very interesting this issue of free will isn't it? Mm. And, and Asia's going to give a talk about it soon I think because there are a lot of misconceptions I feel that a lot of people who've been listening for a while have about it. Yes, God allows us complete free will. But also, as we see in here, there's penalties upon our soul if we use it in disharmony with love. So what is our responsibility with our children and with the people we love or the people who come into our sphere? What is our What would love do in those situations? Respect their free will. And what does it mean to respect their free will, Ken? Give them the opportunity to feel for themselves. Yeah, so we, get, we, we never try to restrict them in where, in where they no. We never try to punish them. We never try to, you know, shame them in the way they've used their free will. But, but is there more that we would do, Miriam? If we saw that they're, if we, if we saw clearly that their actions were going to lead them to have a penalty down the track, we would please share that with them. We would offer them an opportunity, wouldn't we? That's with the, with the people just in, in our mm. sphere. You know, in our in our life, we would we would offer them an opportunity. We wouldn't force it upon them. But if they happen to come into our life, we wouldn't judge them. We wouldn't shame them. We wouldn't try to bully them into doing something else because that is all about avoiding our own emotion. Um, but we would, if if they were sitting in front of me, I would certainly offer them the opportunity because they've they've been attracted to me, and I know some truth. I I might I might say, would you like to talk about this because you know, I have something that I could share with you. And if they said no, okay, that's fine. Mm. When it comes to our children, it's even more serious though. Because who are we? We are God's appointed guardian for this being. And, and as God's appointed guardian, if I know something about God, what is my role to teach this person about God? And the fact that there is a penalty if I use my will in disharmony with love. So I would do much, many more things in that situation. That talents thing, like if we've got the the truth and we don't offer it, then we're misering it and keeping it, which is to the detriment yeah. of others yeah. around us and very often and it's ourselves. Because of our fear that we that we do that. Yeah. yeah. Matt. Um, Mary, it's kind of on topic, but not so much with the book with the free will and children. Um, is it still loving if uh, a mother is pregnant with child? and she longs that, that uh, the child receives divine love. That's very loving. Yeah. That's I mean, super like, duper loving. <laughs> like, I just don't, I don't get the, the free will element, like, because the child's not engaging its free will, and that's okay for the parent to engage on behalf of the child. That's still a loving thing. I pray, for, right. I pray for other people to receive divine love all the time. Thanks. It, ca it can't. Yeah. It can't be. They can't receive it unless yeah. they exercise their own will. Mm. But I can desire it for someone else. Mm. That's really loving. But then you're not going to expect that they start. No. And I, I think that's probably what we're all grappling with. Um, when we say we've got a responsibility to truth, uh, it's sort of we get so heady with it and we tell people truth you want truth there's truth and I think there has been other discussions on unloving yeah so it I've has to be more about, about actions well do you know what it, com it comes back to it's the spirit in yeah. the words mm -hmm. yeah it's mm -hmm. the, you know where's the spirit yeah mm -hmm. if I really love you there's a lot of things that I would do to act in truth, to speak in truth, but it wouldn't be in a shaming, blaming, a punishing way. It just it wouldn't because there's the spirit. Mm. So if I don't have the spirit, 
I can't convey the truth anyway. Because mm. yeah. AJ never wrote to people and goes, oh, I scanned you. You've got this, this, and this. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, so the most loving person on the planet yeah. doesn't do that. That's right. So that's maybe right. that's a good example. It is a good example. <laughs> 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 Hopefully that's the plan. That I'm a good <laughs> yeah. But if I'm sitting down having a cup of tea with you and you're talking to me about what's going on for you, and I have a sense of love inside of me for you, I'd say, hey, like Eloise and I had a, a discussion the other day and we were just sitting down talking about stuff and I said, hey, I noticed the other day you felt like, um, like you couldn't be yourself and I just wanted to say to you, you can always be yourself around me, you know. And so I was giving her a truth about a fear that she had, but it wasn't in the... I don't know, I can't do that thing. What is that thing? <laughs> But sometimes what opens us up more than anything, as we've discussed, and there was something about friendship before, what's usually cracked me open a little bit more is this loving use of friendship when people have really just... Yeah. You know that your friends can see all this error in you and somehow they're going, oh, yeah, that's just your error. We still love you. Totally. Um, because love, love is never conditional. Mm. So love doesn't say, oh, I'll love you when you're like this, Vanessa, you know. Mm -hmm. Lo love loves you, but it never avoids the truth either. So um, love, to me, love is the most powerful force in the universe. And it is the thing that is the only thing that really heals us. Mm -hmm. That's why God created his whole universe in a loving way. He doesn't have a punishing hell because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at our prison system. It's not working. Yeah, <laughs> um, people... Love is the thing that opens us to change, always. And if you, like you said, the thing that is most powerful in your life is when you just feel someone loving you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the book, it tells it's talking about how the lady can get out of the hills, and it says she will remain there until she trusts another spirit in a less miserable condition. Then that will induce her to leave these dens for a less wretched abode. So maybe our role is to just show trustworthiness to people and if they feel they can trust us in any of our dealings, everyday dealings, if they show, see that we're trustworthy just in anything, then they're more willing to trust, to trust us in what we say um, later on. They may ask us um, about... How do, how do we become trustworthy? What they, so that we don't you know, gossip against them and if they tell us something we all you know, But what's the spirit what's the spirit we need to, in order to become trustworthy? Oh the spirit I, of love, yes. yes. I, I'm just making a, a yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the concrete and a suggestion on how to implement that love. Well that's but see be, be careful of getting back to the rule book. Mm. You know, you're saying, oh, if we don't gossip, if we don't do these things, we don't do these things, then we'll prove we're trustworthy. But that's sort of almost imposing rules then on our behaviour, which is we can neglect the spirit of love that should drive those oh, right. things. Yes. No, I was just taking it from the, what the book said. Sure, sure. Yeah. sure. yeah, I'm not discounting what you're saying, okay. just developing it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's keep going in the chapter. How are we going for time? Does anyone need a five minute break? Or? Sure. <laughs> What, what is the time? Quarter to three. three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty big chapter. Okay. What comes next in the chapter, guys? What did you see as truth next? Uh, we've already talked about it, but the law of love, actually, like as said, like the one great law of life. His love? Yeah. What he talks, sorry. I think love never good. fails. Yeah. He talks about it, but yeah. Which is, a, which is a reference to Corinthians in the Bible. Love never fails. Yeah. Matt? Um, a little bit further down, I don't know if I'm skipping ahead. It was talking about um, people who have sinned with deliberate intent. Yeah. Or culpable negligence. <coughs> yeah. Um, there's a few, few there's a, let's just, I'll just um, cover a couple of little truths that came, they're not little, they're yeah. massive, but... <laughs> I'll cover them quickly. It, um, he says that um, he who dwells in God, who dwells in love, dwells in God, who dwells in him. Beautiful. To preach is to act. The way we act says more about our soul condition than anything else. This is a massive truth. Um, and 
I just love that to preach is to act. That that's how they preach. It's through the action, and there's so much relevance in our own lives. Yeah. And, and that's where I talked about that recurring theme that I mentioned earlier. Faith without works is dead. Love leads us to service. When conditions like love and faith exist in our hearts, this will lead us to action and service. And this is the testament to our faith, to our love, to anything. Yeah. I, I, I felt wrote heaps on the action one. Like I just felt like the act, the, yeah, the, um, to preach is to act. is just like action in my life is so, you know, talk about things, think about things, analyse things, you know, gossip about things, but to act on it. Yes. That's the huge, I feel like, the changing force. It's the one thing that's going to change. And I'm just yes. like, yeah, looking going, okay, why don't I want to? Yeah. And then, or why do I act in one way with one person, but not with the other person? Yeah. Um, and I just felt action was just yeah. massive. And we had a discussion just amongst a group of us here while we've been staying this week about, and um, I was saying about the acting part of this path, of it's the thing that takes what we're teaching from our head to our heart, the thing that Susan referenced, you know. That's the way we know the truth. Mm -hmm. That's the time when we stop saying, oh, AJ says that. We go, no, I know that this is truth mm -hmm. because I've lived it. I've acted upon it, I've felt about it, it's all happened in my life and it's, I know it, I know it now. And it's the act, if we don't act, we will never know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's get to the sin. <laughs> the meaty part. <laughs> when, when it just got to the point there where it was talking about the voice of conscience, Yes. Right. So if, if I just go do, ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, he says this, I'm on page 38 of the book. Mm -hmm. That I am perfectly willing to admit. But first of all, you must remember that the way you came is the usual way of admission. And what, that whatever punishment is endured is the natural consequences of deliberate sin. As, th sin, as things done in ignorance or without intention exact no penalty in the judgment of the mists. Mm. But those, we need to talk about that point, mm. but those who have sinned with deliberate intent or culpable negligence, in many cases following the same course for years, stifling the voice of conscience, which is what you want to talk about, Matt, yeah, mm. um, and crushing out their spiritual life, receive their just reward and punish. And... And there again, there's this word punish, I go, oh, it's not punish, it's, you know, it's just the just reward. Um, but he's relaying that to help him understand. And it must, be it must necessarily be that their pain is increased as they realise what might have been under other and better circumstances. Mm. And, and in the next line he says, God never turns aside to avoid the consequences of man's folly. Mm. So that's, that's big, isn't it? Mm. What, did, what did you want to say, Matt, or ask about? Yeah, um, for me, like so many times when I was about to do something unloving in my life, I've actually had the voice of conscience literally speak to me and say there's going to be a consequence for this yeah you know like you can do it but there's going to be something massive that you're going to have to do yeah. like and at the time i was probably applying it more to earthly uh, uh consequences rather than on my soul yeah and um i've had the gift recently of uh seeing the judgment of the mists yeah and seeing and seeing what my my um spirit body looks like yeah and um yeah, like it's it's um, there's there's a lot of sadness coming yeah. up inside of me just because I'm re realizing how often that I just like all the help that I needed to actually not be unloving was there, yes. and I still chose yeah. I still chose to forego that and just use my will to harm myself and harm other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so this this particular part was just so confronting for me, confronting. and then like. Mm -hmm desiring maybe to have the humility to be humble with God's penalty. Yeah. Starting now rather than waiting until then. Well, that, that's what I'm, yeah, 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 that's it. Because it's, that's the truth that we know, isn't it? It's there with us now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't, it's not going to just suddenly appear to us then. If we, can, if we're sensitive to it, mm -hmm. just as you were sensitive, your, your own conscience and understanding of what love was was already saying to you, Hey, 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 you know, so 
Red flag. Yeah, red flag. This is not going to go well. Um, we can open to what that, why that was, and it, we can feel the pain of what we've done here and now. Yeah. So my question is about. Oh, it, okay, it's a bit of a posed question because I have my own answer. But what I want to ask you guys to think about is this idea that things done in ignorance or without intention exact no penalty in the judgment of this. Mm. I thought that I read, um, I, I can't, sorry, I can't remember, but I do recall being um, disturbed by reading in the packet message, messages somewhere that, that your intention was irrelevant or your motive was irrelevant, that the harm you've caused is you, are, you have a penalty on that regardless. Mm -hmm. And that's saying the opposite, isn't it? Well, let's talk about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what do you guys feel about this? Like, what's the truth, David? Uh, it, the, like, you can be ignorant as in, I don't want to know, yeah. or honestly ignorant, that you just yeah. haven't had the opportunity to explore that particular um, uh, event or, or that particular feeling kind of thing. Yeah, and you know what I feel is that God has built in us already an understanding of love. You know, this is what our conscience is. And we all have a conscience. Um, and when I feel that what I wrote next to my reading was about um, how do we deem ignorance? Many of us live in willful ignorance. And, uh, you know, I feel that many times we want to be ignorant and we will our ignorance but that doesn't change the penalty on our soul so really it i feel it is the truth if i do something if i hit a child whether i think that's wrong or not my soul is going to tell me it's wrong and i can choose to ignore that or not i feel that um so and i and i talked to aj about this as well because both of us feel that when we do act out of harmony of love, God wants us to know love. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to skip over it. Mm -hmm. He wants us to understand that that thing we did, even if we didn't understand at the time it wasn't loving, mm -hmm. he wants us to know. So there will be a penalty. Mm -hmm. And you, can you see the love in that? Mm -hmm. Like I, mm -hmm. a lot of people go, oh, but I didn't know and so it's not fair. But I think, oh, but I didn't know and God's giving me the opportunity now mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. That means I'm going to be able to be more loving. So um, this idea that things done in ignorance, we have to be very careful around this. Like I feel there's very little time where we've actually been truly ignorant from a soul point of view. Matt? Yeah, I, I feel very much similar. I feel like a lot of the time we tend to be like, oh, but you know, this thing happened to me and my mum was unloving to me and mm -hmm. I didn't know about this. Yeah. And don't. And that's all just like blather, blather to blather. keep us away from yeah. the fact yeah. that we can feel in our soul already that it's not loving. It yeah. hurts. Yeah. We don't want to take responsibility. And yeah. God's trying to help us take personal responsibility every minute of every day. Yeah. Uh, to go Eloisa. So what does it mean? Like, can you give an example of something done in ignorance or without intention that would exact no penalty? Would meat, or, could you give meat as an example of not? Of not? I, of, don't, of, I mean of the opposite, that, you know, because we, we don't want to know the harm that we're doing to animals, yeah. so, but we're still doing the harm. Yeah, and I don't actually feel that's an example yeah. of ignorance. Um, all I can think of is something like, um, if I was, okay, random, random. If I'm a postman and I've got a parcel, it's got an address on it, and I deliver it. I'm doing my job. Inside of the parcel is like anthrax or a bomb. Mm -hmm. I'm in ignorance of the mm -hmm. fact, and I, ha I have no way of knowing that I'm doing something. Like, there is no intention within me, there is no, I'm just doing my job, but I'm in total ignorance of what's inside of there. Oh, There's no penalty on my soul. Okay. Mm. But if, I, if I'm raised as like, some kind of religious fundamentalist to believe that it's loving to harm the sinners or the government or whatever and I go this is loving me creating this bomb no I can say oh, I was ignorant someone taught me that was love there's a penalty because God wants me to understand that that wasn't love so he's going to place that weight on my soul Matt? Mm -hmm. I feel like at, at the same time that 
Um, when there have, of course, been all these other forces that have contributed to that, of, of course, the whole responsibility of everything that you've done doesn't go to you. Well, yeah, and let's and let's skip to um, the next page where it talks about that exactly, doesn't it? <coughs> does it? Does anyone know where I'm referencing there? It's on page 39 of the book. And Rita, I think this is where you had a question. Is this where your question was? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. Can I just read that mind body or unbalanced mind is the result of sin mm -hmm. more frequently than accident and someone must bear the punishment thereof. Who shall it be? Listen to this awful truth. Every man shall give an account of the deeds done in the body. One of those deeds is the deadly wrong of, propagation, of propagating life without thought or reference to a healthy and competent body in which it can perform the functions requisite, to, requisite to, its, to its advancement which leaves the child to bear the consequences of the sins of its fathers, of its father or mother in its own organism. This may transfer the infir infirmity, but it cannot change the responsibility. The sins are borne by the child, as are carried by the child, but the errors committed in its incompetency are accounted as the sins of that father still, and he will be called to answer for them at the bar of God. Yeah. So, does everyone understand what's meant in that chapter? Mm -hmm. In that passage, rather? Yeah. yeah. Ju ju just before that, that summary that you're talking about, I think, sort of summarises that in short. It's in all cases, justice and equi equi um, equity are meted out unerringly, mm -hmm. and the penalty of all sin will fall upon the shoulders of the sinner. Yeah. I think yeah. that's... So, it's saying that, saying that as parents, the sin that we're in um, affects our children, and the way that we affect our children, we will be called upon to deal with the way we've done that. Rita, what was your question about that? Oh, my gosh, I have a severely disabled child, mm -hmm. and I could have the choice to abort her, mm -hmm. and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the question is, having her now, is that my punishment, or does it, because I have her now, is that my part of my repentance? It's a lot of questions. Actually. A lot of questions, okay. Yeah, yeah. But let's see how I go with answering mm -hmm. it. Um, firstly, we know that God doesn't punish. Mm -hmm. if, if we trust in this, this account that Fred's giving mm -hmm. us, and if we uh, understand the teachings that we have in front of us, and if we have faith, we know that God is loving and doesn't mm -hmm. punish. So there's no way that having Lisa in your life is a punishment towards you. However... God also always offers us opportunities to know ourselves, to see ourselves as he sees us, mm -hmm. which includes not only the wonderful parts about us, but also the parts in error or our sin. Mm -hmm. So you could say that part of what Lisa's experience on life, if, of life is partly showing you some sin that you had in you when she was conceived. Mm -hmm. However... This is not your sin alone, Rita, mm -hmm. because remember you had a father and a mother and mm -hmm. they had a father and a mother. and that, So you cannot say, look at this one situation mm -hmm. between yourself and Lisa and, and, mm -hmm. and also you had a partner and so there's mm -hmm. a lot of factors involved yeah. in Lisa and mm -hmm. um, having her in your life right now. Mm -hmm. what you can, so you can't say, because it's all about my sin that Lisa is like this. Mm -hmm. You can say that there is some sin in me that created this condition for Lisa. Yeah, and I can definitely see that and definitely see her as my teacher and always did. Yeah. Um, the next question is... Well, be, care be careful yeah. about seeing her as your teacher. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I say. When I was on the New Age path, mm -hmm. I saw her right away as my teacher and my new guru and whatnot. Yeah? Yeah. And without AJ, I would have never gone into emotion. So all I did on the New Age path was being at peace with everything. And I was okay and in a happy bubble, but Lisa degraded over 10 years a lot. Yes. Yes. So without AJ and his teachings about looking at myself and my own emotion, I would have just continued with being happy, but denial, denial my own responsibility. Yeah. And she would have degraded. Yeah. But I'm in the happy bubble. Yeah. So, so you can so see that, that, is not, that, that is not fair. That because is not, not everybody will Lisa. find out about H.A. Mm. Uh, pardon? Mm -hmm. not, not everybody might find out about H.A.'s teaching. And what does, why is that? And they might, they might just 
follow in their own wrong track, like I have been followed. Yeah. For all my life in my own wrong track, thinking thinking I was a good girl and thinking all is good. But what but what do we know about God? What have we been talking about about God? God always gives us opportunities to face ourselves. God has created his entire universe to assist us in this quest to understand love. So even those who I mean there's lots to say about what you just said, but it, briefly even those who don't find out, don't find out about AJ, remember things are based on desire, just mm -hmm. as the woman as she entered the path didn't desire to face this thing, so she, she didn't. Mm -hmm. So people must have a desire for love and truth in order mm -hmm. to receive it into their lives. Mm -hmm. Also, if, if somebody passed and they hadn't heard about th this truth, the whole spirit world is designed to help them understand it, mm -hmm. but it's also based on their desire. So we can't so, say that it's not fair. So you, everything is fair. <laughs> it's uh -huh. all based on our desire. Yeah. yeah. So you are saying every everybody gets has the opportunity following their desire and looking at themselves God at has, some stage. Yes. If they want to. What I'm saying saying is God has created his whole right. universe to do that. Yeah. However, if we go back to the um, <coughs> analogy of the talents, mm -hmm. How are we assisting people to have these opportunities mm -hmm. versus how are we living in fear? Because there's also a personal responsibility, isn't there? Mm -hmm. We were talking about the, if I know truth and somebody's in front of me and I love them, wouldn't I then offer them that truth? Mm -hmm. So we can, we can say that um, I do believe that everyone has the opportunity to find the truth about themselves. However, there's a further thing that we could think about, which is how am I helping God in that process or how am I hindering mm -hmm. God in that process? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. I feel like mm -hmm. I'm getting a bit wordy, but yeah. um, yeah. it's a big concept mm -hmm. that I'm trying to condense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also be careful of regarding Lisa still as your teacher because her yeah. situation is the result of sin. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a punishment. But it is, it is something that has happened because there's been unhealed emotions. Definitely, people. years and years of denial. Mm -hmm. I, I totally see that now. Yeah. Also, I talk to my mother and find out things about my grandmother and great-grandmother. Yeah. And it fits all the same yeah. Yeah. stuff Then I end up with Lisa. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Thank you. I'm just feeling, feeling into um, such little, little words strung together. His tender mercies are all over his works. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the truth shall set you free in the Bible. Like, we look at the words and we go, yep, get it, yep, say it. But the spirit of just those two sentences, one being in this book and one being in the Bible, it just, like, if we really got the spirit of those words and allowed it to penetrate into our souls, everything that we believe, it doesn't say in some of his works or truth at times should yeah. set us free, but... <laughs> If we really just allowed it our, uh, uh, as a spirit um, communication to enter us and allow everything that we feel does not believe that to, to arise and be shown through us, through our law of attraction, that we are given so much and we just overlook things. Yeah. yeah. But it is all there. Yeah. And there is mercy. Like and we've been given a book. Like it's just in that sentence but we've been given a whole book to mm -hmm. three books and four books and yeah. teachers like it's just there's just gift upon gift but yeah. we're just the fear of really letting it settle there's fear and, there, and there's sadness isn't there it's like Alexis mm -hmm. spoke about at the start of the group which was very brave you know to say oh, I don't feel gratitude and that's because there's a lot of sadness that's sort of weighing us down and this sense of feeling disillusioned with life when we're a kid yeah and so the more we're, this is why we always rave on about humility. Like when you feel that, those feelings, then you are more able to see his tender mercies everywhere. We have to desire to see it. We have to desire to see the truth of it. But we're never going to receive it into our heart until we're, until we're humble and, and grieve that the other thing. So the other thing when you talk about ignorance, what, could it be said that the same as fear and in terms of a mother saying to a young child, oh, don't tell this person that, and then the child goes into fear and lies. Would the penalty be onto the child, even though fear was ruling for withholding truth, or would that be an exempt? Yeah, um, 
it's difficult it's like there's a lot of again it's not a short answer mm. um and i'm sensing that you're feeling about that for yourself in your own life is that what happened that you were asked to not say something yeah yeah and did you feel there was a penalty on your soul no i just went okay like i i was just but now, now as an adult what do you feel um it weighed on you didn't it yeah, yeah, until the other day that until I clarified you told it. the truth. And I said, actually, I was, yeah, I actually said the words, I was in ignorance when I made, yeah. when I said so yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, it's about the sins of the father are not your own, the sins of the parent. You know, the mother's projected fear and demand that you lie and your compliance with that at a time when you were young um, and she was in control of everything. The, the weight of the sin is with her, but as you grow and you, you your own conscience is there yeah. and you have your own will to exercise, then if you live in harmony with that lie, there is a penalty on your soul. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're in ignorant fear at the time, it's just when you grow up, that fear and ignorance, well, you have soon as, the, soon yeah. as the, uh, the veil's off and you don't act upon that, then there's definitely going to be... Yeah. And yeah. you feel it anyway. God yeah. has built in this thing to say, hey, hey, there's a penalty here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We should probably finish soon, guys, because I think we're over time. But I didn't. I just want to go back to this very important point about the sin. I had a. I had an email from someone. Yeah, I don't know where they're from. Geelong. Lani. Lani. Yeah. She says, "How will man ever be free from intergenerational error?" when he makes bad choices and he himself suffers, but also his children suffer. So she's referencing this, this part of the, the chapter. Then how can we best make amends to all those influenced by our poor choices and then our children's actions as well? It's a good question. What do you think the answer is? Teresa? I always come back to, I've just got to start with me. And doing, and doing my own. Um, repentance and feeling my emotions and stuff because I can't do anything for anybody else um, and then as as I grow in love um, it will change things around me anyway yeah okay uh, Matt what do you say yep I'll thank you yep. my thing is to act in faith with love like as, as best as I'm able mm -hmm. and just keep doing it yeah like even, even if I even if my feeling is I don't want to, if I'm terrified of doing it, whatever it is, if if love is moving me to do something, to just do that. And what I've really got over the last couple of weeks is um, it's all been about Matthew. Yeah. And now I'm feeling like, oh, well, yeah, fair enough. But giving, like, that so much of it is going to be about giving to others and being in service to others and um, demonstrating how love works as it goes into my soul. Yeah, okay. And I, I just but, feel that would be given an opportunity. Yeah, let's get to what Lani's saying because it's a big thing. Hey, she's, she's looking at this and she's going, this is world's a mess. Every parent is in sin on the planet. They're going to pass on sin to their children. That's going to affect their choices. Like, this is a real question. Mm. isn't it like mm. it's we can say oh just be loving you know but and i'm not discounting what you're saying that because that's true mm. but what does that mean in action um i feel aj mentioned this today or today i'm pretty sure you did it's that we have to stop in ourselves now putting anything else emotionally onto our children mm -hmm. which means owning now what i'm feeling in every moment that doesn't mean i've got to be totally error free it means that I just have to go like feel um, my fear for instance so that that does not go on to my child and they become completely petrified of the world as well yes and I can do that yes there is a decision we can make yeah. now which is about stopping the perpetuation of error and we have all the tools available to us and this doesn't just count if we're a parent in our day-to-day -day life we perpetuate error when we live in error we do perpetuate error within ourselves and on the people around us so there is a decision we can make which is about humility truth and love <laughs> um, that will cease this working in our lives and very often we want to make excuses about that because that feels big and scary but really the answer to her question is twofold 
One is making the decision not to keep piling on the error onto this soul or onto the souls around it. This is making that decision to be humble, to desire to act in truth and love. The second part is what Teresa referenced, repentance. Mm. You know, and I, last week, the week before, I talked about exactly there's five big stages of repentance Mm -hmm. they're, they're very real, they're very tangible, and they're not just, oh, I feel bad about what I did. They, they involve feeling the pain of what I've caused in another person, taking action, as much action as I can see to remedy that. So when she's talking about with her children, it's about taking, like going to my children and saying, I did this, I did this, you know, mm -hmm. I can see this has affected your life in this way. I'm going to try, it's, Another part is finding the causal reason inside of myself why I did that, getting rid of it so I never do it again. Mm -hmm. But it's also being tolerant and kind with that person that I have harmed, you know, recognizing that if they're angry that I've done this to them, okay, well, they're going to be. I did, I acknowledge I did something wrong. I have to, t I've set a wheel in motion that I'm now trying to slow down and stop. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's going to be a process. So it's very much about making a decision right now to act in harmony with the truths that I know, but also to do whatever I can in my power to remedy what it is that I have done. That is what I would truly do if I love. Mm. And that is the only way, in answer to her question, that is the only way that we're ever going to change the way it is in multi-generational sin. Yeah. We have to get to a place where we're not in sin <laughs> in order to, to stop that. Mm. Now, many Christians say that's impossible. Um, I'm here to say it's not. Mm. God created us mm. to be a, to be like that. He created our whole universe in order that we'd reach that mm. point. Um, so, and nobody died to save us from it. <laughs> it's our sin. Mm. <laughs> it's it's what we're carrying, and we do have responsibility for it. Mm. And something, you know, there's a lot of beauty in what I see in what God's done in allowing us to have children in allowing us to be parents because we learn a lot about we have the opportunity again he always gives us opportunities we have the opportunity to learn a lot about what real love does how real love acts and is through this very intimate process of conceiving a child and bearing one and giving birth to one we we're very linked to this little being aren't we where there, and potentially there's a lot of love that's created this little being as well. And then the feelings we have in relation to that little being can teach us so much about what real love does and so much about the error that we're in. But th that intimacy that is created through conception and childbirth and child rearing, I'm here to say that if, if that thing doesn't inspire you into repentance, what in the hell will <laughs> mm. you know if that bond and that's what god is trying to help us with all the time he's he's created a process that can be free of sin and error and just be a the process of two people coming together with a desire to create out of love and then they create an amazing perfect little being who's full of creativity and joy and immediately can understand god's universe because they're grounded in that place but when we come from a condition of error all is not lost god still created within that process everything we need to help understand ourselves to understand his love for us how we would love this person and also these feelings that would draw us into repentance to draw us into wanting to correct the wrongs now i'm not saying you have to be a parent to do that but i just see a beauty in that process i don't i don't encourage becoming a parent in order to, <laughs> <laughs> to use the process but i just see in so many things that god has created the the ways that he's trying to teach us and if we don't want to repent for our kids it's hard to understand how we're going to want to repent about anyone else. Yeah, Teresa. Um, I don't know if you or you just said that um, I read recently that um, the purpose of children is to show up the God's way of showing us unselfish love, and I thought that was such a beautiful um, yeah. expression. Well, and if you think about it, 
there's no such thing as unselfish love. Just love is unselfish. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, how, how do we be unselfish? To serve, yeah, yeah. and to, to honour a person as an individual, to love them for who they are and what they give us. There's so much in that relationship that, you know, if you think about it, those of you who are parents now, during that whole process, you're kind of geared towards opening emotionally, aren't you? Mm. Like this is so wow. And, and even the love that brings you together and then the process of nine months of this little being growing and the labor and it's all, it, it all arrives and suddenly people get wide open, don't they? And they feel this thing for this child and they look into their, their eyes and it's, God has created it so that we can understand the, the intensity of his love for us. It's a potential. Most of us never get close to that in our current sinful sin uh, laden state. I've used sin a lot, haven't I? <laughs> um, we don't get close to that level of love for our children, but that potential is there, you know, that we could love. We're never going to love them as much as God does, but we can love them in a very intense way, yeah. Okay, guys, good time to end, hey? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big We got to to truth number twelve in my list of twenty one. <laughs> so you never in Queensland we might do the second half of the chapter so you can tune in um, for next week. We'll see how we go. Thanks so much for this opportunity. I've really enjoyed having you here. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Mary. Thanks for your input. Okay. Thanks, Larry.